Hey guys, this is Ben from Road to VR, and we are at CES 2015. We just got to check out some really cool Leap stuff. We have David and Michael here from Leap, and they're going to tell us about uh, what they're showing here at CES. Um, so, can you just walk through what, what we got to see just now? Uh, yeah, we showed some demos with uh, Dragonfly, which is one of our uh, internal uh, OEM prototypes, uh, and uh, which has a uh, greater than HD resolution, and red, green, blue, and infrared pixels, which can do some really interesting VR, AR, and sort of half-half VR, AR experiences. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we showed some new uh, uh, UI stuff that we're working on for developers, which is sort of a continuation of our widgets, and uh, our mods, and quick switch, and to a more cohesive application, where you, you, know, you look at your arm, and you get a holographic interface, and you can mess around with that, and do some fairly complicated setting tweaks, and then check the time, and switch the, you know, the, uh, the pass-through on, and do some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Michael, um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about this, this turn toward VR, because we, we mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, it was a fascinating thing, but at some point, you guys realized like, this could be kind of the future, uh, where, where Leap is very useful. Um, what made you realize that, and how are you guys, you know, what's the strategy now for going and being part of it? Yeah, I think we want Leap to be in places that really require new and different input than what's possible today. And uh, there, there's obviously uh, an incredible need for that in VR where the, the input is being defined as we speak. So I think for us, what was exciting when we were looking at it was both uh, the incredible amount of excitement and the incredible number of OEMs and energy and great developers that are building really creative things, but also the very clear sense that we could be a part of defining what it is to interact with uh, with, 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 with this new device. Mm -hmm. And so on the Dragonfly sensor, the, the goal of that, as I understand it, is you want to be able to build, in, build this direct, directly into a VR headset. Right now you guys have, uh, for the leap that everybody can get now, mm -hmm. uh, you have a mount. Mm -hmm. and, and that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what are the advantages of building directly into the headset? Uh, so, I mean, of course, uh, if, if people buy a peripheral, we have to make, well, one thing is just price. When you embed something, it's significantly cheaper than when you have to sell it through a retail chain and have a completely different logistical operation. Uh, so it's def it's def you know it's not it's not like a, if you have an embedded leaf, it's the cost of the headset plus a leaf. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, also, um, there's the form factor, and there's you can have features that that actually uh, we couldn't sell in a in any in, a, in any other type of device mm -hmm. at scale too. So we could build a developer device around a new type of module, but it would of course be priced much higher because the volume would be ve very low relative to a consumer like a consumer device. I also think it's in everyone's interest if. Uh, if, if hand tracking or if, a, if any type yeah, of input yeah, is embedded in, in 100% of the devices, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it tells developers that they can go back it and they don't have to, they don't have to uh, settle for only the percentage of the user base that's bought third party peripheral. Mm -hmm. uh, and from the OEM's perspective, it lets them articulate a specific value proposition to the customer. They, mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to give something to the customer that yeah. doesn't have input. This is super obvious. Like if you know, if you buy a computer, it comes with a keyboard. If you have, buy an Xbox, it comes with an Xbox controller. The idea of shipping a device without an input device, you know, is not something that we traditionally do. Mm -hmm. So is Dragonfly uh, the Gen Two Leap, or is it a fork in the Leap technology for virtual reality? Uh, there's a lot we, we do. I would say it's a prototype, kind of like uh, Crescent Cove, mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, uh, in, it's it's a, it's a it's a view into some of the stuff that we're experimenting with internally. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different things. I hope we'll get to show some more soon. And basically, we're trying to we're building these things and we're having conversations with pretty much everybody, uh, everybody who's working on stuff like this, mm -hmm. and trying to understand okay, what does the future look like in mm -hmm. terms of wearable sensors. Well, so um, so I guess the question is more, um, so with Dragonfly you have the different IPD, um, and obviously you want your latency super low for VR, as low as you can get it. Um, do you see that Dragonfly, it's a prototype of course, but um, you know, that is, you're trying to build something that's going to be useful in this use case. When you get there, do you build it into the, uh, the VR headset and then you also put it in a box like you are now for the, for the desktop people and people using it not for VR, or are these kind of diverging? Um, paths of of what you're actually building into a unit. I, I, that, I think that's a great question. I hopefully it is embedded in a sufficient number of devices that there isn't a need to sell it as a standalone developer unit. Mm -hmm. uh, if that ends up not being the case, um, we would consider building a device. But uh, I think that the fact that 
all OEMs today are saying publicly that they believe that hand tracking is, is a requirement for a good experience. Uh, and the, the number of companies entering the space and, and, and our conversations, um, we, we feel pretty good that there are going to be a significant number of OEMs, not necessarily all of them, but a significant number that will have the technology embedded. Mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's not even just for hand tracking, there's a lot of reasons to have wearable camera, like image sensors. You know, whether it's just for pass-through, you know, for safety or convenience, or, or even something like position tracking, which a lot of people think that it's really important to have inside-out position tracking. It's all going to come from sensors on here, and it's very unlikely you're going to have pass-through sensors, position tracking sensors, hand tracking sensors. There is one sensor suite which is going to power all of those things. Mm -hmm. oh, one of the things that's important, though, is Leap is much more software than hardware. And mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that the technology today looks very little like it did two years ago, uh, it, two years from now it will similarly look nothing like it is now. Uh, and those software updates will affect the people who have the peripheral today um, virtually as much, maybe truly as much as, 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 as Dragonfly or, or whatever comes after that. So um, at any given time, there are dozens of different hardware manifestations floating around. Uh, and it's hard to say that one is, a, is, is, is Gen 2 necessarily, mm -hmm. uh, but the software is constantly evolving. Uh, and there are really exciting things that are in the pipeline and on the roadmap to improve the software for everyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are, you know, there, there, there are some, like, you know, the silicon that we use is always getting newer. We always, like, use newer optics. At this point, I really, hardware is not really the bottleneck. It's really everything is software. Whether it's improving, like you know, the user interface on top of on top that people use with, inter with actually use hands for, or whether it's improving uh, tracking so that I can like you know touch a surface and match a touch thing to that surface. You know, there, there's it's all software, mm -hmm. and the only and hardware is really just almost just three specs. It's like field of view, frame rate, and uh, like maybe whether or not it has color, like some kind of resolution, mm -hmm. and and most and the rest is almost all software. So the Dragonfly sensor prototype that we got to play with now has R RGB cameras in addition to IR, which people who have used Leap in its current form will be familiar with. Uh, do you find anything like new that you get out of having RGB other than just I can see the world in color? Yeah, it's uh, you don't you don't necessarily get more out of in terms of like can I pick up a Coke bottle? Like the infrared, I can do that with too. What you get is you get a sense of it. It, it goes from like less being utilitarian and more of like okay, I'm actually seeing the world. Like your brain doesn't really kind of think it's the real world if it's black and white, although it can interact with it significantly better if it was just like a flat image. Mm -hmm. But you do get sort of like this is actually the real world, and then you, what you start to usually do next is you start to you start to get tempted to mix the virtual and the sort of actual worlds in like deeper and deeper ways. And I think that's uh, th like the depth of what that leads to is much more than I think people are thinking. Like, much more than what people have really discussed right now. Like mm -hmm. for example, you know why maybe maybe uh, I imagine in the future op all opaque displays will have like. Uh, a transparency setting. So like maybe I play my games at 80% transparency and I still see my, my hands on my desk right there even if there's no hands in there. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of just having the world around you at all times is actually like really important. And uh, and the idea of think pure virtual reality or pure pass through, those are really artifacts of, of I think of, of just our of, our, of the fact that these are like new concepts and we just haven't really thought about that much. Mm -hmm. And so other than um, the addition of the RGB camera, what makes Dragonfly like made for VR? Uh, the human baseline is one thing we were experimenting with. The other one was uh, a much wider, uh, the ability to have a much wider field of views and sort of change how those are facing. And we have some different modes where we can we can go between like pass through and sort of m mere, more pure infrared modes. And there's like just it's a uh, the peripheral was just the peripheral was uh, uh, really made for a short range, a very specific type of short range tracking. Uh, and uh, really just machine vision. And this was our first foray into both changing the machine vision a little bit to sort of make sense for VR, and also having that human vision component of the sensor suite. Mm -hmm. uh, in, the, the, in, the, in terms of just sort of raw, although it can go to higher frame rates, uh, the main difference is the, when the baseline is a little bigger, it lets you uh, reach out a little bit further. So when you say the baseline, you're talking about the IPD? Sorry, yeah, the, the, the separation between, the, yeah, they call it baselines for cameras and IPD okay. for humans. Uh -huh. Uh, so the distance between the cameras has an impact on how well it works at further distances. So mm -hmm. right now the peripheral is limited, so that if you're tall, I, I don't, I guess if you're really tall, it's tough. You, it, mm -hmm. you can't really reach all the way out. Okay. Whereas with this one, you can, uh, which is it, which is a, a real deal for like a real product. But for development, it wasn't something that we pushed as much on the peripheral. Yeah. Uh, especially because when you're if it's on the table, you don't really want to do this. So there was no reason to. Uh -huh. Um, so there's, I mean, there's the just kind of 
the physical issue with machine vision, which is that if you're not looking at what you want to track, you can't track it. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have really upped your game in terms of when you bring hands back up, it's really fast now. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you, I mean, how do you get around the challenge of like, I want to hold a ball and I want to mm -hmm. look over there and look back. Is that mm -hmm. just something that you have to always design around? Uh, there's, there's, a, no, there's a lot of things that we're going to see. Sometimes if it's just wider field of view, like the Dragonfly, you know, can have a really wide field of view mm -hmm. so that we can track your hand even when it's out there. Uh, and, uh, or it could be anything from just hiding wider field of view to just like, maybe in the future if my hand goes out of the field of view, my API says, hey, I remember there's a hand still there. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you if it's moving, but I remember it's still there. And as a developer, I still have just that API call that mm -hmm. I can make. So like it could be any, there's any number of types of situations that I think we'll, uh, mm -hmm. solutions we'll see. And so going forward with Dragonfly, those are things that you guys are actively researching because it starts to become really important. Yeah, and and and, uh, uh, and, and maybe yeah. it may not even be that there are two cameras in the future wide field of view. Maybe that there's many different cameras as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many different paths. The sort of like maybe if maybe the answer maybe I want more than 180 degrees, and maybe the answer is why well, I'll have a camera up here looking totally up and a camera down here looking totally down and I have 270 mm -hmm. and or maybe I have something on the back or something crazy like that mm -hmm. and so the it, this stuff can continue to evolve uh, although one thing that was really important that we got out of Dragonfly was that even when we give people wider field of views it's not something that it's not like it's twice as good people really like to see their hands and it's and and we find people are just usually not asking to use their hands a lot when they don't see them mm -hmm. I think maybe it's different if I have like a sword but those types of use cases, there's all sorts of things you can do for that. You're probably holding something, and it's a different game. Mm -hmm. And so we got to see the swipe gesture, which takes you from uh, seeing a view of the real world to and you're seeing a view of the virtual, virtual world, and it seems to work great. Who, who came up with that, and, and when is that going to be, um, or is it out there as a demo now? I think we released the source a couple of days ago, so it's out there. Uh, me? Yeah, you, I, you just dreamt that up one day? Yeah, uh, yeah I was... I really wanted to be able to go back and forth, and we had a really long debate about what kind of gestures you should use, mm -hmm. and uh, it came down to the transition. So, like, do you fade? Do you wipe? Uh, what do you do? And we decided, you know, uh, like this would be a cool gesture, maybe. We're like, hey, this could also have a really good transition, and then we realized that if you match the transition to the gesture, it kind of, like, it's much better than if I do this and everything fades. Yeah. It's much more memorable. And yeah, it's it does feel like flipping a visor between real and virtual worlds. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. We, we spent we spent a lot of time researching both what types of movements wouldn't accidentally be triggered, even in a fairly wide set of ways that people interact with their hands in different applications, mm -hmm. and also uh, how to make the transition less jarring. Mm -hmm. And it's a good example of the types of widgets that we've put out over the past few months, and the types of stuff we'll be putting out over the future, where. Uh, even fairly basic concepts like how do you push a button in VR are, are things that our UX team will spend you know weeks, maybe months, maybe several months uh, doing a lot of testing and a lot of iteration. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we want we want it as easy as possible for developers to build great stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, the transition is really important. If you're like if something's really close up and you push and all of a sudden everything's really far away, and it's vice versa. You really don't want to you really want to flash between very different depths. And so yeah. this allows you, it creates both a movement, so like I am expecting it, yeah. and it also creates a transition that, you know, it's, so everything is sort of cohesive and expected, which is really important. And so uh, for our final question, when can people expect to see more or uh, maybe get their hands on Dragonfly? There will be a, a lot of uh, announcements over the coming months about uh, partners that will be incorporating Dragonfly mm -hmm. uh, into their devices. Uh, and we'll also, be continuing to share it with our partners and developers and uh, our, our community team has been out there trying to show it to as many people as possible. So, you know, we're not, we're not trying to hide it and we want to be open and, uh, you know, Dragonfly is, is also not an ending, it's it's a beginning. Uh, and like I said, at the end of the day, what really changes and improves is the software. Uh, and that's that gets better every two weeks, every month, every year. Uh, and uh, the software in tiers is going to look a lot different than it does now. Uh, so we're Dragonfly is, is a really exciting beginning, uh, but but there's also a, an infinite amount of opportunity ahead of the, uh, ahead of that and after that. Mm -hmm. Well, great guys, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, and good luck with the rest of the show. Thanks.